so good to see so many familiar names and faces and also new ones uh, in, the, in the chat and in the Zoom list. Um, hello, good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Danielle Hartunian. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations here at Gallatin. NYU School of Individualized Study. For those of you who are NYU alumni, friends and family out there tuning in. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you all to our Artist Spotlight event featuring Latasha Barnes in conversation with Yvonne Curry Thomas, two fantastic alumni and really good friends of mine now from Gallatin's graduate program. This event was ideated by our alumni working group in the arts. I see some of you members signed on. It's really good to see you. Um, it was ideated by our alumni working group in the arts as a way to celebrate the many amazing artists in our own alumni community, of which there are too many to count, but we try. Um, Latasha and Yvonne are both part of this group. So I wanted to thank the entire group for their efforts for uh, this whole academic year so far, all the events that you've put together. It's been such a pleasure to collaborate in partnership. Um, I also want to thank our Gallatin Black Alumni Group, which Latasha and Yvonne are also part of, um, for their partnership and collaboration as well. We are celebrating Black History Month at Gallatin right now. And this event is just one in a wide range of programs that we have happening all month long. So be sure to check the calendar online for more events and information. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce Yvonne in just a moment, uh, and then she will introduce Latasha and the two of them will have an open dialogue um, with all of you tonight. Um, if at any point you have questions for either of them and you're like me and you are like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna forget what I wanted to ask, please feel free to type it in the chat, but we will try to save some time at the end. Maybe we'll answer them throughout. We'll see how it goes. Um, before we officially begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that NYU is on the homelands of the Lenape peoples a place with a deep indigenous past that remains vital to the Native peoples in the present. And finally, I wanna give one last shout out and thank you to Tracy Clapper, who is working behind the scenes. Tracy is our production manager of the Labowitz Theater in the Gallatin building. And um, she's making sure everything is running smoothly with the tech. Lord knows I need your help, Tracy, so thank you. And with that, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Yvonne Curry Thomas. Making sure I see Yvonne. Hello. Um, Yvonne received her BA in dance from Brooklyn College and has a certificate in performing arts administration from LaGuardia Community College. She got her MA from NYU Gallatin with a concentration in performance, community aging, community organizing, and aging. She received Gallatin's Graduate Interdisciplinary Academic Excellence Award, SIP Award, and Sustainability Grant for her artistic thesis production, Seen Your Life. She is a choreographer and member of the Theatrical Union Stage Directors and Choreographers Society SAG AFTRA, New York Women in Film and Television, League of Professional Theater Women, and she's president of Women in the Arts and Media Coalition. Barry Gallatin, just a few, just a few things. <laughs> and brilliant in all of them. During her 15 years of work in Europe and South America, Yvonne trained dancers, singers, and actors for television, stage, and theater. She was the tap instructor and choreographer of the Ballet of Venevision in Caracas, Venezuela, and the jazz instructor choreographer for Leona Lavis Count's School of Dance in Milan, Italy. In Venezuela, she also worked with Yolanda Moreno's Danzas Venezuela and as cultural attache at the American Embassy. Aside from her professional work, and teaching at the Third Street New School Settlement, 
Yvonne is a teaching artist and has served on the faculty at Brooklyn College's Preparatory Center for the Performing Arts, as well as the Caribbean Cultural Center Arts and Education Department and Harlem School of the Arts for Herb Alpert Center. She is a master teacher and performer trained in ballet, modern, tap, jazz, and Afro-Caribbean. Her work credits include a list of music videos, shows, television credits, celebrities she has trained, and international performances that she has directed and choreographed. I could go on, but I will leave more for Yvonne to share with you all. Welcome, Yvonne, and thank you so much for being here with us for our first Artist Spotlight. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you to Gallatin also. Uh, this is definitely a pleasure, I would say a dream come true because it's something that Gallatin has, has not done before. So uh, coronavirus has been the thing that has brought this together. And I'm extremely happy to be here with Latasha Bonds. If you do not know Latasha Bonds, by the time we finish this hour, you will be thrilled and any place you go hereafter and you hear the name you will immediately know who to associate it with. Uh, we are both graduates of Gallatin master's program. Uh, she graduated in 2019. I graduated in 2017 so we kind of crossed paths. So as I came out she came in. Uh, I cannot say she followed in my footsteps because she has footsteps of her own that are very full to fill. I am not going to read from her bio because I'm going to let her tell you some of the wonderful things that she does, but she is internationally acclaimed. Just pick a dance style. She, she does it, whether it be she does hip hop, lindy hop, swing, tap. Uh, if I start from the beginning, before all of that dance education and everything, uh, she's a Bessie Award winner, has spent 2021 at Jacob's Pillow, uh, The Yard. Any of you who are dancers, you know that these names and, and our field of work are at the top, highly regarded. So that's where she is, highly regarded. And she started working September this uh, last year, 2021. She took her new position at Arizona State University. And I know everyone at Gallatin is extremely proud of that, Latasha. But how did we meet? Because I'm going to go back and take <laughs> you back before she started this dancing to give you a little bit of insight about what makes Latasha, Latasha. <laughs> Thank you so and much, Yvonne. It's, it's really, I know we've been wanting to do this for a while, so I'm deeply honored that the, that the entire group chose me for the first Artist Spotlight, but um, even more than that, this is just, like you said, this is really phenomenal for Gallatin to be able to put this together so we can share what we've been up to since, since we've left. <laughs> um, but we met, I believe it was at the first alumni council meeting um, in 2020, wasn't it? Yes, you are correct. Okay. Yeah. But coincidentally, I was just thinking about it and um, we actually e-met before we met in the alumni council. I don't even know if Danielle knows this story, but, um, and we'll, I know we'll get to that more in, in the context of the conversation, but um, I think you were the director of the military alumni group. I, I, and I messaged you, yes. <laughs> messaged you wanting to join. And we, we made some brief connections then and then saw each other again in the alumni council meeting, so. <laughs> so what, what, what Tasha is referring to uh, one of the sides of her story that is not actually in her bio, she is a military veteran. Yeah, true story. Uh, she, came, <laughs> she comes from a military 
family. Uh, we've made our military connections, which uh, is just so outstanding. But we have a lot of connections. And I mentioned that military background because that regimented. <laughs> That regimented background is the thing that really makes her the strong individual she is, the experiences that she's had. And also in that first meeting, we realized we were both born in Richmond, Virginia. So Latasha, take it from there. <laughs> yes, I don't even remember how we came to, to that point of connection in our story, but we are both from Richmond, Virginia. Um, I, of course, grew up in, in between all of the facets of Richmond, Virginia. Um, my dad just affirmed to me that I was born in Richmond proper. Um, so growing up in Church Hill, then I guess until I was maybe four or so, and then moving to the suburbs in Haranko County. And um, my family, of course, was from uh, Winnipeg, Virginia. Um, so it's Chesterfield County, just on the outside of, of Richmond. But yeah, Fusing all of the country life with the city life and the suburban life, <laughs> all all inter intertwined into one. It, it's um, it's a complicated place to be from, Richmond, Virginia. But it's it's one of the places that has definitely shaped um, the requirement in me personally to have a a broader perspective on the world. Yeah. And you grew up in Richmond, also, right? But no, where? I said you said you were right. I was raised in Staten Island. I was born in Richmond. Yeah. But I, I, I was raised in Staten Island. And of course, I also served as a cultural attache for the American Embassy in Caracas, Venezuela. But uh, one of the things I did not ask you before when did you begin dancing? Oh. As, as a child? <laughs> Yes, that, that's my, my favorite story and my mom's favorite story. Um, we always say that I was dancing in utero. So she likes to tell the stories of, uh, of me throwing off her groove when she went to go to my dad's parties um, in her belly and that I wouldn't calm down until she would go next to the speaker. And then I would have my nice little, little rumble going on and she, she could calm down and enjoy the music. <laughs> okay. And it's... Um, yeah, it's, I have been dancing longer than I've been breathing, honestly. Um, and it's, um, it were my family. They were absolutely my first dance educators and um, my most tough dance educators as well. <laughs> I've had some pretty, pretty tough, you know, um, tradition bearers share things with me and some pretty tough professors, but none of them can top any of, <laughs> any of the people in my family. And um yeah, my uncles were in performance troops. And so I was always mimicking what I saw them doing. They were always preparing for rec center competitions. And even my parents were a part of uh, social groups, the social clubs um, through the military retirees club in Richmond. And they were always practicing their group entrances. And then they had these little dance moments that they would do. And I don't know if they were the things that actually went with the songs, but <laughs> they were always, always in preparation for for the next show, it was, it was crazy. But it gave me a deep love and appreciation for so many different ranges of music because like I said, my uncles were in their, their teens at that time. So that was like on the, the precipice of hip hop. And my parents of course were coming out of the funk and soul era but also were heavy in that eighties R&B pocket. And then of course my great grandmother and my grandmothers they were dancing with their friends too all the time. And then at the family parties, it was everyone's music was being exchanged and yeah. Yeah, there's always been dancing, yeah. I, I think that's one of the things that I can say a lot. Um, as, as I say, I'm, I'm Black, so I can only speak about Black households. But on those weekends, the, the chicken, the dinners, the parties, the yeah. music, my, my father, was an excellent swing dancer. And I remember because I was so tiny, as they said, they would pick me up in the air. And, you know, when I was two years old, I guess they thought I was going to be a dancer. So I was in 
dance class. I was the only black child in my class. And I, I didn't, okay? So we, we, we identify yeah. with that. So now from there, let's kind of fast forward. Okay. Those 10 years in the military, yeah. you had that dance background. And after you got out of the military, what was it in your mind that took you to your, your BA? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question because actually my BA is in business. <laughs> well, dance is a business. Show dance business. is a business. You're absolutely right. Um, and actually, I pursued that while I was in, thankfully. Um, I did the concurrent enrollment while I was in the military. And um and completed my my bachelor's actually I completed first my fine arts degree and then I decided I needed more well actually I didn't decide in order to get promoted I needed to have a four-year degree as well as that one so I went and got another degree <laughs> and got that pursued that in business um oh wow there's so much that happened in there wow uh, as far and so are you saying for my BA or for for my MA sorry well before before you got to Gallatin okay before I got to Gallatin um, yeah, before I got to Gallatin, actually, wow, so you're throwing me a loop. I didn't think about this one. <laughs> I actually, I was putting my, my business degree to use. I, I was running a personal training firm. Um, I was servicing um, special needs uh, clients, as they say, or patients, uh, mostly patients with MS and um, other function, function, uh, movement functioning challenges. And I was also working with um, an amazing organization called Urban Artistry at the time in DC and kind of wrapped up within there. I also was recovering from a car accident. Um, I, I shorten it and say that I had a short-lived career as a hood ornament. I was hit by a car in a crosswalk, uh, walking. And it was through that that phase of recovery um, that I actually came back to dance at, with the rigor and study that I, I was able to with Urban Artistry. And um, I started with popping <laughs> of all things. I know some people <laughs> on here who know me are like, wait, what? Um, so I started with popping and then was introduced to house dance, which gave me a little bit more movement and freedom in my hips. And um, yeah, then I just, I, I hunkered down and just got serious about dance as, as, a, as a professional path. Um, up until that point, I think I, I, I acquiesced to the notion that I was just gonna use my brain and be a benefactor to dance because I was already 26, 27. You know, nobody dances at 27. You're too old to dance at 27. That's what they would like people to believe anyway. And I, Wow, yeah, I am. Um, but, but we don't say that at Gallatin. No, we don't. <laughs> That's what they outside of the Gallatin mindset would like for you to believe. <laughs> exactly. Just one thing, because I, I do know there are some people on here who are veterans. Just quickly, oh. what branch of the military were you in? Yes, I, I apologize. I was U.S. Army all the way. Okay. Oh. <laughs> right, well, I, I represent United States Marine Corps, Simple Five. <laughs> and so we, oh, we talked about this as well. So, we, yeah. How, we, well, we have that overlap because I did have Marine Corps Junior ROTC in high school. So, oh, okay. Kind of, so, how kind of in, in the midst of things, how did you first hear about balloting? Oh, my goodness. So, I was in, I was in such a, a challenged and dismantled discombobulated if you will place in my life and because sadly of that that accident and a few other incidents while I were while I was in service um I was also a disabled veteran uh still am a disabled veteran I don't know why I say was <laughs> I think I worked so hard to stay ahead of it I kind of speak about it in past tense sometimes but um uh I have several things that I have to negotiate on a regular basis anyway being a disabled veteran, one of the things that they do for you is they pay for your college. Um, 
So I was in a place where I was in need of income. I, I was in a really fragile mental state. I was going through a divorce. So everything in my life was just completely out of sorts. Um, I, I did not feel that I was an effective trainer to my clients. I didn't feel that I was effective manager or co-artistic director for the events and festivals and things that we were doing with urban artistry. So I was just like, I need to figure out a refresh. I need a reset. And I don't know what I need to do or what I need to study or how I can do that to, to change this situation. But, you know, I was like, I have the opportunity to go to school and kind of amplify these experiences that I have and figure out a way to coalesce them so that I can actually put myself in a place to be in service instead of focusing on the things that are falling apart around me. <laughs> and so I actually put out a call on Facebook, uh, just a message. This was when I was engaged on Facebook, not so much anymore. And a good friend of mine, Laura Wendley, actually responded when I, I asked, you know, the Facebook universe, I said, well, what should I do? What should I pursue? What should I study? And from our personal private conversation, she actually chimed in and said, you know, you will be perfect for an interdisciplinary degree. And I said, an inter hootie what now? What do you, what's, what's that? What are those words? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> and of course she recommended immediate, like first off, um, I think it was a program at Northwestern that was nonprofit management in theater, or nonprofit management in dance or something like that. And I thought that was interesting and, you know, kind of up there, especially when I was working with other nonprofit groups like Urban Arts. I said, yeah, that's in alignment, but maybe, maybe I should do something else. I don't know. And then I just Google searched interdisciplinary master's degrees. And the first thing that popped up then was at Gallatin. Um, so good job to whoever the social media manager was then and the website director then. <laughs> Great job on the SEO. <laughs> and... I don't know what prompted me, but I just dug in. And of course, in my mind, everything just started to form fantastically. Like, oh, if I could get to New York and really dig into to studying the elders and the pioneers of house and hip hop and, and jazz, like they're all there, they're right there. So why shouldn't I study my master's? But I don't wanna go to NYU to get a dance degree. And like, I immediately shifted myself right back to the traditional box once I started thinking about going to NYU. And I was like, no, 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 no. She's an interdisciplinary, so look at this thing. And so I was looking at Gallatin and realizing that from a lot of the, the past, you know, thesis submissions, it's like, I can really do whatever I want. This is, sure. no way anybody's gonna give me a master's degree or whatever I want. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> But sure enough, I, I proposed exactly what, what I was feeling at the time. And in a very haughty way at that time, I, I think I was more focused on, I think, what did I say to you? I think I was trying to re-Africanize Lindy Hop and jazz and hip hop because it was, being, it was such in a place that it was being so heavily appropriated. And then of course, as I shared with you, um, over the course of my studies, it was like, yeah, you can't make something more black that's already black. It's black forever like it's, it's not a thing so you can improve your representation collectively in that space but it's always going to be black no matter who's engaging and who's sharing in it and that was something that that transitioned for me thought process wise something in my mind that I made bigger greater room for I would say um as my studies move forward but getting into Gallatin I I was trying to understand where I fit in even in that that zeitgeist. And so I started looking up dance anthropology and they started talking about Bordeaux and all of these other people. And I was like, I don't want to do things like that. And then of course I came across Catherine Dunham and her field of research, ethnochoreology. And it was so mind bending that a woman whose legacy and artistry, who I thought because of how, how revered she is for modern and contemporary movement, Yes. that I thought I was at odds with ended up having the same sense of purpose and, and responsibility and dedication to her culture that I needed to enact in service to hip hop primarily, but through the lens of jazz. It was just my, it was mind boggling that she also came to a deeper understanding about her culture through the lens of jazz. And it's just, yeah. Anyway, it was just being able to present to them that I was going to, that I wanted to study ethnochoreology as opposed to just dance anthropology black studies and performance studies and how how to speak to how to speak in the professional language um to what we do in in our social settings like to really amplify and, and change the language there so that we have a deeper sense of regard for what we do 
naturally, as we say, but to show how that that is performative and how it is professional and how it should be elevated and celebrated in these quote unquote high places. You know, one of the things that I would say, which I found outstanding about Gallatin, um, and I think in our situations, which we are much, much, much alike, the divorce scenario and all of that, as they say, been there, done it, and did it, and I understand my sister. With Gallatin, even though we were there at two different times, we came to Gallatin with the same intent. And that's the thing for us that worked so successfully. So beautifully. Everyone does not have. And the fact that we transition not directly from high school into college, into the masters. Because yeah. by the time we got to Gallatin, we knew why we were going to Gallatin. We knew what we wanted to study. Yep. I mean, we might not have had every course written down. That's where the help of the advisors came oh in. And I think my advisor, Julie Mac Malnick, may be on here listening to this story. Is but she? we knew we were coming there. We were on a mission, just yes, like we in were. the military. We were on a mission. <laughs> And my mission was, I knew I was going to finish in the two years. And oh, yes. not, not one day or one semester more. Because I think what some of the teachers at Gallatin did not realize, while we were also checking out our grades, we were also checking that, that VA status <laughs> to see if we were still getting the money for the next month to go to school, if we had the number of credits. You know, all, all, all of those things. It was so frustrating. Like, I just want to focus on what I'm doing. I don't want to budget. Like what just, look, you, you broke me down already. If we're talking, speaking to the federal government. <laughs> you broke me down already. Just pay for the school. Like, stop making this difficult. Stop making it difficult. But you're but, right. It was, we, we were, and like I saw, like I did tell you, I actually, I was one of those, I don't want to say overachievers, like that's a, a negative thing, but. I did. I, I combed the entire NYU course catalog, not just for the anthropology school and <laughs> for the dance school or for Tish, like everything. I was like, what is potentially applicable to me getting more of our tradition bearers who did not have the opportunity to get into these higher education spaces or be represented or presented in these high platforms, quote unquote, what do I need to do to galvanize my experiences, my language, and my position to be in service to getting them in these places where they need to be. And even if it's just by, you know, by proxy, by me, or do I need to improve my writing skills? Like what, what things do I need to do? Do I need to learn? Do I need to gain in this master's experience in order to be of deeper service? Again, I know I say it all the time and people are like, oh, you just say that. But I, I recognized a long time yeah. ago, like there weren't any specific, there stopped being specific performative goals, stopped being specific achievement goals. The main focus for me as a being is to be in service to my community and culture in whatever spaces I'm called to do so. And it's, it's amazing that I get to do that. And like, I think we were touching on this yesterday, the, um, it is the experience that I, I, I gained at Gallatin that, that's been able to really help me do that. And this isn't just a Gallatin sales pitch. It really, it really cracked me open in, in a way that, that showed me where in my own biases and in my own adapted <laughs> marginalizations of myself in my artistry and my skill that I needed to make space for deeper understandings and ways of, of existing. Like, I'm so grateful to Eugenia Kissin, Dr. Kissin for all the things um I would say you know because she's another one who always was challenging me to own own my own my achievements um I will say that I think it was maybe about 95 96 percent my outline of things that we did um but she absolutely she absolutely oh she absolutely amplified everything that I, I needed to gain from that experience um, especially by sending me to in Fred Moten's direction. 
that just changed the game for everything. <laughs> I would say one of the things that I, I noticed when I came back to the United States after those 15 years overseas, I realized in our country and in our city how educated dancers are. Not just how educated they were, but we mentioned Catherine Dunham. Yeah. And her study of anthropology, which she expressed so deeply in her choreographies that, that we all know of, even with the story of Emmett Till. Right. Or all, all of these great dancers that came before us, and here we are now to carry on what, what they have placed in our hands. You teach tap. So I know you remember that performance of Sammy <laughs> Davis Jr. that last time on the stage when he passed that ball, those shoes over to Gregory Hines. And actually his birthday is Valentine's Day. Yeah. And then he passes it on to Savion. So we, we have all of this as black women. Yeah that we are carrying on. And how do you really feel your Gallatin experience is not how has it helped you, but how, how do you still feel it even though you graduated a few years ago? I think the, just a quick, I know my friends in the, in the room will, balk at this but I'm, I'm not a tap dancer but I have percussive foot capabilities <laughs> so I do teach uh, some jazz steps that are from the tap canon but um, I would not dare to say that I'm a tap dancer or a teacher but I do know that that scene <laughs> but in the context of how Gallatin continues to shape <laughs> my existence um it may sound a bit tropish to say, but honestly, it's the friendships. And I think that's another reason why when Danielle launched this, this platform for the Alumni Council, it was such, such a boon because I didn't know how much I needed to stay connected. Like I had my, my, little, my little crew, um, the, the Musketeers, we call ourselves. I think Kelsey might be in the chat. Hi, Kelsey. <laughs> um, but Kelsey Murphy, myself, and um, Mary J. Marcassiano, we were inseparable and continue to be so, um, even if we're not physically together. Sorry, I moved away. Um, <laughs> but it honestly has been the, the way that we're able to, to step in and support each other, not just with opportunities or references or recommendations, like really understanding this completely mind altering way that we aim to exist in the world and trying to trying to function in and around the compartmentalization that sadly so many other people seem to find necessary to functioning <laughs> that we just honestly don't believe in anymore but talk speak to because we know other people won't really get what we're saying if we don't um, so so to have people like yourself to be able to dialogue with in that way who understand that even though you might say this thing, yeah. you're thinking in 18 different parallels at the same time about how that thing is affected or can be changed or can be improved. It's, um, it's um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And, and your work that you're doing now at the university, Arizona State University, and I, I know you are on airplanes every other week flying back and forth, New York City, Arizona. But what are, what are you actually doing at the university now? And I was also wondering, having been that Gallatin MA student, yeah. do you find yourself using any Gallatin anything in, in your work? That oh, wow. I absolutely do, um, especially because just, teaching that it's okay to exist outside the parallels or outside the binaries, as I like to say now, is, um, is something that really was driven home and supported like tremendously at Gallatin. 
And I know that just even in our personal existences, sometimes people have trouble contending with that. And to see it artistically, you know, makes it a little, a little bit more accessible sometimes. So giving, giving students the permission to understand and explore how things that seem disparate can actually, and are actually connected and can influence and enhance what you might wanna say artistically. Um, that I find really, really amazing and really wonderful to, to be a part of and to, to witness that, that exploration in young students, young dancers, especially. Um, the work that I get to do, you know, kind of deconstructing societal norms with the general studies population too, is, is really fascinating to watch their minds ex explode, literally recognizing that they, especially as young people do have the power to change how pop culture is or is not representative of who they are or who they wanna be in the world. Um, to let them know that they do have a choice regardless of what the algorithms seem to tell them. Like it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And to teach them like the biological technology behind those things, that's, that's really, it's really mind bending for them. But it's, um, it's really been amazing to, to serve as assistant uh, professor of dance at ASU, like this is still within my first year. And to have so much overlap, especially because there it's, um, it's a combined school. So we're in a center for music, dance, and theater, and we take that seriously. <laughs> so we have some several opportunities where we're, um, I guess I'll just say cross-pollinating and not so much teaching dancers, musicians language or the vice versa, but teaching them how to communicate with each other. Um, not just so that you can get through the show, but so that you can actualize your ideas. So you can actualize all these crazy things that you have in your mind about, well, if this samba rhythm exists here, why can't I slow motion through this other swing movement and then like push it up, like all the things. <laughs> Just talking through one of my students' ideas. But it, it's, it's really been powerful to be able to know that even as, even as um, Dr. Kissin asserted in my, and Dr. Deb Willis, who also sat on my panel too, um, asserted to me then that I didn't need a master's to assert the things that I was bearing forward as a, as a tradition bearer. Um, but it is encouraging to the generations of students that I'm engaged with and to my elders to affirm the things that they've done, to affirm the things that they're thinking by just simply saying, yeah, I know you think that's outlandish, but this prestigious institution gave me a master's degree in that very way of thinking. So don't divorce yourself from this extra fantastical way that you wanna exist in the world. Like there is, there is a lane for you to do that. And it doesn't have to look like everybody else's. Yes, it says MA and a lot of people have MAs, but no one else has an MA in ethnochoreology, black studies and performance studies. Cause I made that for me, cause that's what I needed. And it's, it's really powerful to be able to walk in the world that way, knowing that you carved that lane for yourself and to be able to infuse that into other people. It's, yes, it's a big responsibility too. <laughs> yes. I, I, I truly believe like the same as what you're saying. People told me, oh, I know there were people who, who thought I already, they thought I was going to NYU for my PhD. Yeah, everyone still calls me doctor. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure, yeah. And <laughs> some said, oh, you know, why, why do you need one? You, You've worked all over the world, you've done this. But I, I agree, when you come back and you are encouraging your students to educate themselves, mm -hmm. because dance is not just movement. Not the movement comes from the internal part of ourselves, from our mind, from from our thoughts, our, our experiences. Like we say, and it's the to, process of our living. Yes, it, it, yeah. exactly. And to be able to give that out and then see somebody return it back to you in movement, girl, you know, that is deep. It's so powerful. Yes. It is, it's amazing. And, and it happens, the thing that I, I love to assert, of course, is that and it's not, again, it's not holy shade on the academic institution, but to remind the students that you don't need a higher level education to be in service in this way. You just need to recognize that you have the capacity to do this. And if you need to come to an academic institution to situate yourself in that, absolutely. And go get those resources, those connections and galvanize each other when you're out in the world doing this stuff. 
but to recognize that it really is more about you being committed to the process, to the experience and actually figuring out what the best way is for you to share that with other people. I know we have standards of performance and all of these things, but yeah, it, it really is just about it. And at the end of the day, I know you say this too. We, we talk about stage right and stage left and all of these things. But in the end of the day, if you're not situated and comfortable within yourself, it doesn't matter what choreography I give you, what stage direction I give you, it's going to look a hot mess. <laughs> so teaching, teaching each other how to really make space for our own personal points of understanding and to bring along with that the cultural context of the movements that we're, that we're working through to yeah. tell our stories. It, if you can't find the confidence in yourself, remember the confidence that Marie Bryant had dancing <laughs> next to Fayard Nicholas. Like, right. seriously, come on. I, I, I always say when, when I get up in the morning, I have to do my me time because if my mind is not clear, mm. I have not stretched my body, I cannot give out what I want to get back from someone else with the intensity 10 times more. When you're on a stage, I always say, you're not just dancing for the people in that front row. You have to touch all of those that are in the back in that last row. So what we do is very dynamic. But let me just ask you two quick questions because I see it's almost time to wind up. It went by so fast. (laughs) I I told Danielle that I really thought this was going to be great. Uh, I don't know how Danielle feels about it, but I know we have had a wonderful time in this exchange. And I truly hope that of the people who are on, any of them that do anything of what we do, who enjoy the arts, that they can feel our passion and the joy that we have. So tell me, have you performed well, since you've been in Arizona? Have you oh, performed wow. out there? What do things look like for 2023? I know I want to 2023. I need to be back, back on the wood. <laughs> so what about you? Oh, wow. It's, it's been... Um... It's been really amazing uh, getting settled in here, uh, especially with all the work back and forth, um, because my my work performatively, uh, the Jazz Continuum, uh, which is a project, um, a concept and and a performance. um, And the project in and of itself is aimed at bringing uh, particularly street and club dance um, black dancers deeper into their personal understanding and relationship with jazz Um, and then also in many ways to pull some of the, the jazz dancers who I know who really throw down and do the damn thing. Hey, Shanna, I see you in the chat. <laughs> um, to really bring them um, closer and more confidently towards a place of moving in ways that are truly authentic to them and not just in, in the canon of Lindy Hop. Um, to give them space to be full, full dancers, not just style um, specialists, which there's nothing wrong with that, but again, Mainly, it's a selfish thing. I just want more people to play with. That's all. (laughs) But uh, beautifully, the Jazz Continuum has several engagements um, that will be announced as soon as we are allowed to (laughs) for contracts um, that will be happening uh, in and around New York and in some other places in 2023. Um, As well as I've been traveling back for a swing out, the uh, Lindy Hop and Jazz Dance stage production that we were able to put forth with uh, oh, my beautiful, amazing friend, Kayla Teicher, uh, Nathan Bu, Evita Arce, and the wonderful musician, Al Vilner, um, where the brain trust of, of that particular um, group. And, uh, oh, sorry, my, also our friend, uh, Macy Sullivan, as well. And that is a global representation of the power and majesty of Lindy Hop and jazz. And um, we are going on tour starting in March, um, also to be announced soon. Actually, no, those dates just went out. Um, and so, yeah, just look to those websites for that. <laughs> also, I know I'm doing all the things. Oh my gosh. Uh, honored to be one of the, the curators for the um, Jerome Robbins Dance Division Oral History Project um, this year, alongside my sister, Michelle Bird McPhee, um, the executive director of Ladies of Hip Hop, for which I'm also board chair. And um, it's, uh, 
it's a lot of work. <laughs> it feels like I'm back in grad school again doing these field studies and <laughs> recording these interviews, but it's amazing to be able because of, again, because of um, the work that I, I was able to do at Gallatin to be recognized in this way and to, you know, allow Michelle to, to be a part of this also. And for us to make space to get some of our street and club dance elders and pioneers, as well as some of our Lindy Hop and jazz dance pioneers um, into this archive so that they can continue to be recognized for their, for their work and their contributions to the greater dance world. Well, um, we got a I question. Think that is absolutely outstanding. I know some people I, I'm glancing at, at the chats as we go oh. along. Some, there's a friend of mine that's asking about a website for some of the things that you are doing. I don't know if we have time uh, as we close out. I had a 30 second uh, cotton, cotton club video. <laughs> well, uh, actually I see, um, I see two things. People asking, can we list the websites? Uh, Which and I was yeah. gonna say, if you two wanna send me your websites then I can send everyone a meet, an email after this event, probably And tomorrow. I will say, honestly, the easiest way to find all the things uh, is just to follow me on Instagram. <laughs> I do a, a better job of sharing things in my stories than I do, um, and on my link tree, than I do of actually posting on my feed. So I apologize for that if, you know, the feed is your thing. Um, but Julie asked a, a wonderful and a beautiful question. Um, and thank you again for, for the kudos on Swing Out, Julie. Um, it's a, such a powerful and amazing show. And she asked um, succinctly, do you see yourself now as being a bearer of that tradition? And humbly, I, I actually am, um, not at my own behest, but at the insistence, <laughs> continued insistence <laughs> of my elders. Um, the first time they made this request of me uh, was actually in 2016. Um, at an event called uh, Hopping on the Hudson that uh, was in honor of Miss Norma Miller and Don Hampton, uh, who was with us then still. And <laughs> Miss Norma, uh, Barbara Billups, Sugar Sullivan, Chester Whitmore, and Chaz Young, who were all in a, in a house um, on the Rockefeller estate, of all places, most random thing to say ever. We were staying on the, on the grounds of the Rockefeller State to perform for a dance and music salon that they were having for some of their friends. It's great. And uh, somehow they all just descended upon me and just asserted to me. So you're ready now. You, you ready to take the torch? I was like, uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, actually they didn't say take the torch. They were like, so you're ready. And I was like, yeah, the rehearsal was great. Performance is it's gonna be good tomorrow. We're gonna do the thing, shake that thing. It's gonna be great. And they were like, girl, ain't nobody talking about no performance. <laughs> And that was the first the first time that I was given given some of the some of the reins. And as time went on, Miss Norma made a point. <laughs> Anytime she was anywhere and I was in the room, uh, she made a point to you know flail about and call me forward. I was like, oh, it's, nobody's watching her. And I'm, I would go up, Miss Norma, do you need anything? Need some water? You need you need some food? What's going on? She's like, oh no, baby, I'm good. I just need these people to know who you are. I was like, I, you know what? I can't. <laughs> I I'm not doing this with you today. <laughs> but it was it was beautiful to be able to to be in their in their in their space and in conversation with them and for them to teach me the aspects of their artistry of their legacy that they wish for me to carry forward. I am by no means the be all end all of the things that they wish to have carried forward. The things that they felt I was the best bearer forward for <laughs> they gave me and um, definitely did their part to make sure that those of us who they also imparted information to um, were in conversation and concert and support of one another. So it, it's, I'm, again, I only get to do the things that I'm doing and share the things that I share because of the community of people that I come from and that I continue to work with. So it's, it continues to be a building legacy just as it was for them, so yeah. I, I, I can identify with that because as I think back, before Catherine Dunham uh, passed away, we had honored her up at Jacob's Pillow uh, for her birthday. And I, I would take, after I came back to the States, most of the Dunham training uh, things that were done at somewhere city center at Hunter, but hmm. just being 
in Catherine Dunham's presence, even as she was older, teaching from a chair. She was just so powerful. And every movement not only told the story, but it took you back decades, decades, oh, decades from slavery, everything, the way the shoulders moved, whatever it was. And that was something like you say, coming from those ambiences. And I see someone said, do you feel like you are, you know, a torchbearer? Yes, we are. Yeah. And yeah. if I had to finish with anything, passing <laughs> it over to Danielle. Uh, you have had two sincerely, genuinely dedicated people tonight, dancers, yeah. lovers of our craft, of what we do. Uh, words cannot really explain. Uh, I want to say, Thank you to you, Danielle. And thank you especially to you, Latasha. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Yvonne. It's it really is so so great to be able to, to be in conversation with you because I know I again, and we try not to use too too much lingo because we know we can get caught up in all of that. But it really is great to be able to, to speak to these things to with someone who has such a similar journey and found power in the Gallatin mindset and being a Gallatinite to be able to walk in the world and do the extra amazing things that we've been able to do. So I, I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of this legacy and tradition with you too. So thank you. Well, Danielle, we're turning it over to you. <laughs> thank you. Um, gosh, I'm just beaming. Uh, and I know you two especially know me more personally. So you know, it always comes from a place of sincerity and not just flattery because it sounds nice or cute um but all the thanks and love you're getting in the chat is uh so well earned and deserved and it's honestly I'm always like humbled to get to know both of you better and if you asked you mentioned Yvonne a few moments ago you said I don't know how Danielle feels but I know we felt excited and I have felt excited, but I will add and say relieved that we did this because, you know, I feel like I have been smiling for 60 minutes straight. I don't know how you all do it as performers, <laughs> but just out of happiness that we did this because, and I'm relieved because I feel that I got to know you two ever since that first council meeting that you came to. And I've been like kicking and screaming in the virtual pandemic, being like, how are we going to make this happen? And I'm just, even though it's, you know, it's like, it's just a conversation, but it was like, wow, this conversation, yeah. you know? So I'm, thank you for, you know, accepting our invitation and for, you know, being game and putting this together. And I'm always at a loss when you all say thanks for doing this, because I'm like, I just take the date and the time when we come well, but you really, all of you Gallatin alums are what make it happen. So I will just send the thanks right back and you're both wonderful, energizing luminary. And I'm just so ecstatic that we did this. So thank you for being here. Um, and thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Um, we will be continuing. Oh, yes. One last, I guess, before I wrap, if anyone's have, if anyone has any last questions, I didn't mean to gloss over <laughs> that. I got caught up in all my emotions, clearly. <laughs> Um, but feel free to drop it in the chat if anybody has questions. And if not, you can also email me. And as I said, I will send a, a follow-up email this week um, with both Yvonne and Latasha's like links and social media and websites oh, and different um, <laughs> videos and performances. There's, yeah, there's so much to watch. I mean, we thought we went back and forth a lot on how much to share tonight, but you all can Google that too. So we were like, let's just focus on the conversation. Um, but we do have many more uh, Black History Month events uh, throughout the next few weeks. Uh, it will, the culminating event will be our annual Say It Loud uh, showcase of Black arts and activism. So I hope you all are registered for that. Um, I think there are some people here tonight who may might be part of that. I don't want to be a spoiler. 
Um, but it's a wonderful, wonderful event. So please register for that as well. We can just continue the Gallatin love and um, keep these conversations going. Did I do it justice, Yvonne, Latasha? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And as, as the things come up, I'm, I'm sure notices will go forward yes, from Danielle. I was like <laughs> taking notes. I'm like, I need the update on all these things. Oh, I will um, share. I will share the one last thing. Um, it's it, again, it's a very weird thing to share, but uh, it's happening right. because of all the work that we've been doing, and I'm really grateful for it. I'm going to be featured on the Today Show sometime soon. Not a big deal. <laughs> okay, well, still send just kind of like, what the hell? <laughs> but um, yeah, grateful for that. So be on the lookout for that. Be on the lookout. Yeah, coming to a TV near you. <laughs> um, we will definitely be sharing, please, Gallatin watch party. Yes, Jessica, let's do it. I love that idea. Um, I did get some other questions um, really quickly, I guess, before we go. I did get yeah. one. Uh, do you two have any tips for combating burnout these days um, and getting through like creative blocks? Oh, those seem like two different questions. Do you want to start, Yvonne? <laughs> uh, but how to combat burnout and whatever mm -hmm. it is. Number one, try not to even go there. Try not to even think about it because in this world we are living in right now, and if you're not living in this world and the world that came before COVID, we were still running around gig at three, gig at six, going from one place to another. Make sure you drink water and get as much sleep as you can. And as they say, take your vitamins, your fruits, your vegetables to stay healthy and keep a positive and a spiritual, positive mind, spiritual attitude. Yeah, I will say too, um, it, it, it does, it does take a special brand of person to, to live that way, <laughs> as I'm sure Yvonne is all too familiar with. And you, you come to understand your, your ebbs and flows. And so being communicative about when you're approaching mm -hmm. burnout is honestly helpful. Um, not to put yourself in a place where you start to panic over mm -hmm. opportunities being lost or missed or, or what have you, because you don't show up. Um, again, scarcity mindset is not something that Gallatinites should be even considering because that's not how we roll in the world. <laughs> Nothing is scarce. Um, and I don't say that flippantly talking about our natural resources. I'm talking about in the way that we manifest and move in the world and create opportunities for ourselves to, to thrive. Um, scarcity mindset has no place in, <laughs> in the Gallatin zeitgeist, I should say. Um, so really being honest and some people consider that maybe being too vulnerable or oversharing or, or what have you. But if it's something that's going to affect your artistry and your ability to do and be the thing that someone is asking you to do or be, you have a responsibility to communicate that that has changed. Um, mm. uh, case in point, honestly, for me, as I don't mind sharing it, I was supposed to have a showcase um, this week with uh, Gibney. And it's something that we were developing since 2019. And it kept, of course, because of the pandemic, and then we tried to reset again, and then we tried to reset again. And by the time we came back around to this moment um, to try to produce it, it my, my mind was just not situating in, in the way that made that performance anything close to what it was intended to be. <laughs> not intended to be mm. per, per Gibney or the platform, but for me personally. I, I just, mm. I was thinking about other ways to fulfill the contract, but it wasn't anything that I really was mm. still as, as present in as I was with that original, that original thought in that moment. And so I had to communicate that honestly. And I asked mm. honestly for what I wanted. Um, so not just to postpone the opportunity. I was like, let's just, in an ideal world, we would cancel this and you would still pay me what we could, what we talked about, because, you know, it wasn't my fault <laughs> that we weren't able to do things. Um, but it also isn't my fault that I, I've changed. So, and fortunately they honored that yeah. because I, I communicated about what I needed and what I wanted. Um, and fortunately it was mm. within their, their capabilities to do that. So yeah, be honest with yourself and continue to be honest with everyone that is supporting and working with you. Cause that, that honestly is the key to, to getting rid of burnout. I, I, and I know Kelsey knows this all the time. Like I, 
we have tons of friends who have done amazing magnanimous things and they still get stressed out about due dates and timelines. Like, yeah, <laughs> time is a construct anyway. Like ask for more time. Okay. And you know, one of the things I'll, I'll just <laughs> add in quickly that Latasha and I shared yesterday, uh, it goes back to some of that beginning military training that kind of sips in to the mindset even when you don't realize it. And that's why I said in the very beginning that that initial training is part of what has made Latasha Barnes, Latasha Barnes. Such a wonderful note to <laughs> culminate on. Can we get more time for this talk? I know. I honestly, every single Latasha and Yvonne know we've, we've done more than this event. Every single time we have, I do anything with Gallatin alumni, the feedback I get is, can we have more time? Can we do something longer? Which I love. That's how you want it to be. Um, I don't see any more questions outside of that one in the chat. And I, I want to do be mindful of time, but thank you all for being here tonight out in the Zoom audience, family and friends. It's not really an audience. We feel like family. <laughs> and thank you again to Latasha and to Yvonne for sharing your conversation with us. Like I said, I'm so was excited and very relieved that we finally got to bring this outside of just our friendship um, and with the larger Gallatin community. So thank you, thank you endlessly. I hope you all um, join us throughout our events for Black History Month and I hope to see you all soon. Hope everybody has a great evening. Thanks, Take care. Everybody. <laughs>